I'm Tal Dunikovsky and I work in the communication section at ECMWF. I would have normally welcomed you um, in our office and would have given you a real tour of our premises, but um, we're doing it virtually, clearly. We have this morning Sam, who will give you an overview of ECMWF, and then we have slightly changed the program. Uh, we will have Fernando instead of Jenny coming after Sam. And Fernando will talk about the way we run our forecast at ECMWF. And finally, our last presenter will be Jenny Walk, who will give you a tour of our supercomputing facilities. And um, you'll have a sample of the nationalities that we employ at ECMWF. I'm French, Sam is British, Jenny is British as well, and Fernando is Portuguese. So that will give you a little flavor of our working environment and i'm done so all yours sam brilliant so just a final check that you can hear me okay and see the screen yeah we can hear you and we can see the screen great brilliant okay thank you chantal and i should probably start with a, a brief apology for any um any kind of roughness in this presentation uh we had a bit of a, a flustered moment this morning and to compound that uh, I actually got contacted yesterday and asked to self-isolate because apparently I've been uh, in contact with someone with COVID. So I will actually be giving this presentation from my home instead of the office, as I was hoping to do. But uh, we'll try our best. Um, so I'm going to begin with a <clears throat> a kind of overview, a general overview of the uh, of the centre, uh, including a brief history and uh, an introduction to how some of our operations work. Uh, and how we produce our forecasts. So I'm going to <clears throat> begin by recounting the story of, of ECNWF and how it was founded. So let me take you back to the, the late 1960s. Uh, at this time, several meteorological centers uh, in Europe were already producing regular weather predictions using numerical techniques, um, building on a research uh, that had already, already was a few decades old, going back to the uh, early experiments of John von Neumann and uh, Jules Charney on the ENIAC computer in the 1940s. And though these numerical techniques were broadly successful and able to produce reliable weather predictions uh, on the short range, that is a few days lead time, medium range prediction was already understood to be a much more challenging problem. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's so challenging is because when you consider the medium range, you really have to think on a global perspective. And this is because synoptic scale weather um, it moves across the globe over a 10 to 15 day period. So uh, you cannot really get an accurate forecast if you only consider a small area of the globe. And so um, such a forecasting system would be challenging for any single meteorological center to, to implement by itself. So the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast was established as a joint undertaking between 18 European member states uh, for the with the express purpose of advancing the science of medium range weather prediction and producing operational forecasts for use by its member states and here in this image you can see the signing of the ecnwf convention in brussels in 1973. so i mentioned that there were originally 18 member states and since then this has actually expanded to 23 member states especially over the last 15 years we've taken on uh, several more members and we'll actually be uh, increasing it to 24, I believe, with the accession of Montenegro. In addition to that, we have 11 cooperating states who have a slightly looser uh, relationship with the center. So uh, for most of its existence, ECNWF has resided here in Reading uh, in the UK, and the sites here in Shinfield Park has certainly uh, served the center well, and it will remain the headquarters for the foreseeable future. But nevertheless, our Reading site is showing its limitations recently, both technically and politically, of course. And therefore, ECNWF has decided to become a multi-site organization. So the headquarters will remain in the UK, uh, but the new data center will open in Bologna. And we'll also be opening some new offices in Bonn uh, in Germany. In fact, those offices are pretty much uh, ready to go. So the decision to move the to site the new data center in Bologna uh, came about a few years ago, and this was because the the current site does not really offer the uh, capacity for um, expansion of the computing system and um, data handling service. 
Uh, whereas the new opening of the offices uh, in Bonn really is a direct result of the decision of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. Uh, ECNWF is a successful bidder of funding uh, from the European Commission. We are funded by many different projects, including myself, in fact. And so in order to secure this funding in the future uh, and allow us to bid for that funding, we decided to open a third site uh, firmly within the borders of the European Union. Uh, and Germany uh, was picked uh, for that site. And both of these sites, these new sites, were decided through uh, quite an intense but healthy international competition with about 10 states competing for both uh, in turn. So Europe is our focus, of course, uh, but we do have numerous connections around the world. And you can see uh, a number of these on this, on this map here. So we have the member and cooperating states in blue. Uh, and interestingly, you'll notice that uh, some of our cooperating states are actually outside of Europe, like Morocco, for example. So thanks to these uh, global collaborations, we are able to get much more accurate weather predictions than we would otherwise. Uh, for example, in the last 10 years, we have begun to assimilate more and more satellite observations from China. And these observations were made available thanks to a, a um, cooperation agreement with the Chinese Meteorological Agency, which was signed uh, sometime last decade. Now, when it comes to forecasting the weather itself, ECNWF takes an Earth system approach. So the atmosphere is where the weather, occur, uh, weather occurs naturally. And, and so that is our focus and has been the focus historically. Uh, we have a, a state-of-the-art in-house global atmospheric uh, modeling system, which we call the IFS, the Integrated Forecasting System. However, if we only considered the atmosphere by itself, then the uh, time out that we could forecast the weather with any skill would be severely limited. So even on the medium range, uh, you do need to consider other uh, physical processes in order to forecast the weather with any skill. Nowadays, we have a coupled system underlying all of our forecast products. So along with the atmosphere, we run the ocean model NEMO. This is a, actually an, um, an external uh, ocean model developed by a consortium of various different institutions. And uh, we couple this um, to our atmospheric uh, model. And the, so these two are really the, the two main processes. But of course, we consider other ones like uh, we have a land surface model and um, a sea ice model, for example, a dynamic sea ice model. So we model all of these different physical systems and they all couple together um, in a very uh, holistic way. Now, in order to simulate this Earth system with accuracy, we must be able to observe it uh, regularly and comprehensively. This is not just to develop the model. We need to compare our model against observations. Excuse me, I've just skipped a slide. We need to compare our model against observations in order to uh, verify it and develop it. But of course, we need those observations in order to initialize the forecast themselves through data assimilation. So ECNWF takes in 800 million observations every day from an array of different observation types uh, around the globe. Uh, for example, we rely heavily on satellites, uh, not just microwave and infrared sounders, but even recently, uh, GNSS radio occultation data. Uh, and so these space borne instruments give us a bird's eye view of the weather, allowing us to see right down through the clouds to the Earth's surface. And they pretty much form the bulk of our uh, observations nowadays, at least in terms of data volume. In addition to those, we have some more traditional observations like radio sons, basically weather balloons, which give us uh, vertical profiles of the weather from many hundreds of locations around the globe. We don't just observe the atmosphere, we also observe the marine environment. Uh, so we have, for example, many weather buoys uh, on the oceans and Argo floats. And there are many more, some of which are shown in this uh, diagram, but uh, some of which are missed out. So these observations are all quality controlled and then ingested into our data assimilation system, uh, which we call 4D VAR, the four dimensional variational algorithm. And this gives us an initial condition for our weather forecasts. Putting it all together, the, the Earth system model, the observations and the data assimilation system, ECNWF's weather forecasting system essentially gives us a, a virtual world to play around with, which really does replicate behavior seen in the real world. 
accurately capturing even the feedbacks between different components of the Earth system. I'm not sure why this keeps skipping my slides for some reason. Um, for example, our atmospheric model passes information on the strength of the surface winds uh, to our um, ocean surface wave model, which responds accordingly, providing fluxes of momentum back to the atmosphere in a kind of two-way coupled process. And you can see this depicted on the bottom right here. We are therefore moving towards what you might call a digital twin approach to modeling the, the Earth's climate system. And you'll be hearing more and more about this term digital twin over the coming years. But ECMWF doesn't just produce standard uh, weather forecasts. We are also responsible for a number of other uh, hazard monitoring services. And here are two examples, which I'll elaborate more on later. ECNWF provides uh, fire forecasts for the Copernicus Emergency Management System. These forecasts take data from the Earth system model. Ah, I think it's because I've screwed up the uh, animation timings. Um, it takes information from the uh, Earth system model on the condition of the soil, how dry it is, for example, and the, the strength and direction of, of the winds to produce maps of fire risk uh, over time, essentially a fire danger forecast. And this information is very useful to decision makers to assess the risk of disasters such as the California wildfires, which we've all heard about so much recently. Another example of actionable information that ECNWF provides, uh, in this case in cooperation with the uh, Joint Research Centre in Europe and the University of Reading, is GLOFAS, the Global Flood Awareness System. GLOFAS uses data from the ensemble forecasting system of ECMWF, and I'll explain that uh, system in the next slide, and is able to provide information on flood hazards by combining data uh, on precipitation and soil moisture conditions. So I just mentioned our ensemble prediction system. This forms another pillar of our uh, modeling philosophy, uh, the other one being uh, the Earth system modeling uh, approach. So we, we have a probabilistic forecasting system, recognizing that weather prediction is inherently, inherently uncertain due to uh, errors in the observations and sparsity of those observations and errors in the model itself. So we've developed an ensemble prediction system in order to quantify these uncertainties and provide probabilistic estimates for different weather events. Our ensemble prediction system consists of 51 ensemble members, that's one control member and 50 members with slightly perturbed initial conditions and slightly perturbed uh, boundary conditions. And from this ensemble, we can derive uh, probabilities for different extreme weather events. We can see this uh, depicted in the diagram here. Our current ensemble system runs at a slightly lower resolution than our state of the art high resolution. A prediction system, which is just a single model integration. Uh, of course, if you have 51 members, in order to minimize cost, they have to be at a slightly lower um, uh, resolution in order to uh, minimize the computational load. However, these two systems are gradually converging uh, over time into a single system as we emphasize the ensemble uh, more and more. Uh, in fact, our new supercomputer will allow a, a, an upgrade in the resolution of our ensemble system, potentially up to uh, 10 kilometers resolution, which is almost uh, the same resolution as our current high res uh, forecast. So we should expect to see some real uh, improvements in the skill of our ensemble system uh, over the next five years or so. Now, uh, let me introduce a few of our specific uh, deliverables, and I'll begin with our, our numerical weather predictions, which is really, I suppose, our, our headline product. Uh, as with other forecasting centers, we produce standard meteorological forecast products, uh, some of which are shown here. Uh, and many of these charts are actually freely available now at the link uh, you can see at the bottom here. So you're welcome to, to uh, peruse those yourself. Uh, and I find them actually quite useful in my personal life for. Um, uh, figuring out when to have picnics and so on. So from our deterministic high resolution forecast model, uh, we produce forecasts of uh, two meter temperature and 10 meter wind, uh, things like a 500 hectopascal geopotential height and 850 hectopascal temperature. These are just sort of standard forecast products that all operational centers uh, produce. 
And these are often used by member states as uh, kind of base products on which to construct, from which to construct uh, more useful everyday um, weather forecasts, the kinds of things that you see um, on the smartphone apps. And on the right, we have a typical product for an ensemble forecasting system. This shows the ensemble mean and spread for mean sea level pressure. And this information, personally, I think is very interesting because often this is missed out on the uh, various weather apps. Um, probabilistic information is still not really communicated to the general public. And so if you look at these charts, you get a real, um, a, a much more precise uh, and um, fair picture of what's going to happen with the weather. So those are the weather forecasts themselves. But uh, as I mentioned, we have a number of other kind of actionable um, monitoring uh, products. And here is a three examples taken from the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring System or CAMS. So on the left here, we have the monthly Copernicus Climate Bulletin, uh, which is pretty much exactly what you'd expect it to be. It's a it's a, a report published every month by Copernicus giving a, a state of the uh, climate system. And we produce things like a maps of um, surface temperature anomaly compared with um, historical averages, for example, which allows us to track climate change in real time. So the center doesn't just focus on weather. We also have a couple of uh, climate change related um, activities. We also produce forecasts of air quality, uh, various different atmospheric constituents, for example, uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, this is very important for wildfire areas, for example, <clears throat> and ozone. And these kinds of uh, air quality uh, monitoring systems are really useful to observe, especially over the last 18 months um, when the number of polluting vehicles uh, reduced significantly during periods of lockdown. We were actually able to detect that in our system. So I've already mentioned um, about um, our uh, uh, wildfire prediction system and our, our um, hydrological forecasts. Here's a couple of concrete examples of what that actually looks like. Um, so in this case, we have um, GLOFAS, which is uh, related to our, the Copernicus Emergency Management System floods or CHEMS floods for short. And this is actually this forecasting system is driven directly by data from our uh, ensemble forecast system. Uh, and is um, uh, also in, takes in data from our historical climate reanalysis system uh, and reforecast data. And these data are all readily available via the Copernicus data, data store uh, or CDS. On the right here, we have um, a kind of more in innovative product. Uh, this is called FIRE. And this helps us to assess the probability of ignition of wildfires by lightning. It makes use of a, a lightning parameterization system developed by Philippe Lopez here at ECNWF, uh, which is um, interesting because he's actually from the research department, he's not involved with Copernicus. And so this highlights the kinds of synergies that we have um, through the different um, teams of the center. So it's, this um, fire prediction system is built using uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, using basically a, what we call a super learner, which is a combination of different machine learning models all working together to derive a forecast of uh, ignition or no ignition um, based on past events and driven by uh, predictors from our forecast model and satellite observations. And this product was developed by ECNWF uh, in partnership with the European Space Agency. That's, that's another example of um, the fruits of our cooperating agreements. It's still in the development phase, but we hope to actually um, start producing these forecasts operationally uh, sometime in uh, 2022. Now, ECNWF regularly verifies its own forecasts and compares it not just with other centers, uh, but with itself in the past. Uh, and I should add that when we do compare ourselves with other centers around the world, we often uh, rank number one or somewhere near the top. Uh, though uh, over the past few years, we have experienced more and more uh, competition, which is uh, very much a good thing. On this chart here, you can see the evolution of the skill of our high res stratospheric forecasts going back from the present day to 2013. What you're looking at is uh, three different pressure levels in the atmosphere, which are all in the stratosphere. And as you can see from left to right, we have a gradual reduction in the uh, root mean squared error of the geopotential height. Uh, particularly uh, over the last um, year or so. The model cycle 47R1, which 
uh, was came online uh, last June, I believe, gave us a real boost in the skill of our stratospheric uh, forecasts. And this will really help uh, not just stratospheric studies, but it would also allow us to um, assimilate satellite data more accurately uh, in the stratosphere. In terms of our uh, ensemble prediction system, we've also seen quite significant improvements in skill there too over the past few decades. The prediction system came online sometime in the mid-90s and what you can see here is the evolution of skill from 1998 onwards with um, two running means, uh, 12 month in red and three month in white. You can see here an interesting seasonal cycle in the skill of the ensemble forecast. But nevertheless, when we look at the 12 month mean, we see a pretty monotonic increase in skill. This is basically showing the lead time at which a certain skill score reaches a threshold. And so the higher this number is, the better the forecast is. The further out in time, we can forecast the weather with skill. And we don't really have any reason to believe that this trend of increasing skill should slow down anytime soon. Uh, indeed, I said already that there's still, uh, there's still a lot of space for improvement in terms of the horizontal resolution of the ensemble forecasting system. So we expect this to increase further over the coming years. The model uh, version that ecm is currently 47R2, and that went online a few months ago. The next model cycle will be 47R3, and uh, this should be coming online um, later in the year, hopefully in October. And this is likely to be the final model cycle run on our current supercomputing system. The next one, probably 48R1, will be run on the new supercomputer, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the focus for this new model cycle is to upgrade the representation of moist physics, things like clouds, for example. And uh, we expect to see quite a significant improvement in the uh, distribution of rain forecasts uh, from this model upgrade. On this graph here, you have basically a histogram showing the frequency of different precipitation uh, events. In the white curve, we have the observations. And in the yellow curve, we have the current model uh, well, not for, not the current model, actually, but basically the current model. And you can see that the current model under predicts extreme, uh, extremely heavy rain and over predicts light rain. Whereas with the new system in red, uh, we have a much closer correspondence uh, with the observations. So from this model upgrade, we expect to see uh, an improvement, uh, especially in the forecasts of uh, precipitation. Now, I'm going to finish with a couple of slides about our new sites. Um, I mentioned already that uh, our new data center will be uh, based in Bologna. And uh, you can see a couple of images here of the uh, building, which is essentially completed. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had the um, chance to visit it myself due to obvious reasons. Um, but we are hoping to hold, um, uh, well, we were hoping to hold the new high performance computing workshop there actually next month. But of course, that will be virtual now. Um, and so uh, over the next year or so, we'll be installing um, various data handling systems uh, and the new supercomputer. So the data center in Bologna will be hosting basically all of our data products uh, in its tape archive. And um, we'll be having a, a new supercomputer installed. In fact, ECNDF has a number of supercomputers. We always uh, run a few just for redundancy's sake. We currently have two Cray XC40s, and our new system will consist of four clusters um, provided by ATOS. And so we'll see a real boost in our computational capacity. Probably uh, you'll get a good five to 10 times speed up on most uh, computer programs. And this will probably also allow us to run many more experiments uh, with our member states for research purposes. Um, so that's very exciting. And um, finally, we'll have our new offices in Bonn. Uh, in fact, people have already started to move there. Um, as of now, we have a few uh, staff members there already. Uh, at the moment, we are based in an interim site provided by the local government, uh, which is basically on the UN campus uh, there, not far from Cologne. And uh, this site will basically be the focus for most of the research that's related to the European Commission. For example, the you may have heard of the Destination Earth project, whose goal is to build a series of digital twins of the Earth system, uh, building on ECNWF's Earth system model. 
and this is uh, very closely related to the EU's um, various programs and so uh, most staff members associated with that program will be based in Bonn and they'll be in the interim site until uh, a new building is constructed which should hopefully be opening in uh, 2026 so that's also very exciting and naturally like basically every other uh, large institution around the globe we have learned a lot about working remotely over the past 18 months uh, and so this will form a real test of um, uh, those systems in maintaining the integrity and uh, collaborative spirit uh, of the European Centre uh, as we split up over three different sites across Europe. So I think I'll finish there. I think I've spoken for long enough um, and I believe we'll be moving on to uh, Fernando, I suppose. And thank you for listening.